know Sam, I was sitting out in my backyard the other day. Mm, really? Yeah, and I was, I was staring at my apple tree. Hmm. And it just got me wondering, hmm. how many apples do grow in an apple tree? Oh, that's a good question. I have one of those in my backyard too. You ever wondered that? I have. That's a great question. Well, it finally occurred to me though. Really? All of them. All of the apples grow on the apple tree. All, all of them. All apples grow on a tree, on yeah, an apple tree. Right. Huh. Kind of like a lemon tree. Yeah, all lemons grow on a lemon tree. Lemon Pe trees, yeah. Peaches. Peaches, yeah. Ha Cherries. Yeah, hazelnuts. Hazelnuts. Nectarines. Nectarines, all of them. Gummy bears. G gummy bears? Yeah. What kind of trees are you growing? Hey, we want to welcome you to our service this week. It is great to have you with us. Yes, we have got some great things uh, to announce one of which is the opening date for Foothills Church. We are very excited about that. In fact, you might be wondering, where are we right now? Yes. We are on a lift overlooking an empty auditorium. auditorium. But we'll give you the date and the times and all the details at the end of the service today after the final worship song. Yes, we're very excited about that. So enjoy the service and we will see you when it's through. Welcome. Come, let us worship the Lord together. Let us exalt his name. In unity we sing the praises of our God, our only King forever. Sing our God. Our God, a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid rise and fall kingdoms once strong now shaken we trust forever in your name the name of jesus we trust you we trust the name of jesus
Almighty God will lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God will lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are I count on one thing. Let's try it. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. And the same God who's never late is working all things out. We believe that you're working all things out. Yes, I will. Lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Yes, I Never fails, will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Come on, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness, they go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, O Lord, who walk in the light of your presence. Lord, we walk in the light of your presence this morning. 
Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much just for uh, watching again. You know, uh, today we are going to talk about what appears to be polar opposite expressions, blessing and mourning. How can one be blessed while they mourn? I mean, it seems pretty strange, doesn't it? Yet this is exactly what Jesus said. And I just love the fact that that what Jesus does often is he likes to kind of rattle our mental and spiritual equilibriums. He likes to say, you know what, you think life works like this, but really it works like this. Jesus knows that to experience mourning and grief and loss will just forever be a part of our human experience in this life. Nobody's getting away from this. This pandemic has certainly proven that. Therefore, Jesus explains how blessing happens even when we mourn. Now look at this next beatitude. Matthew 5, 4 says, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Our hearts do mourn. They grieve over all the brokenness that we are exposed to in this world. 
you can't get away from it. You, you can't be successful enough. You can't be rich enough. Uh, you, you can't be popular enough, smart enough to experience a life without mourning. The older we get, the more brokenness and darkness we experience. It's no wonder Solomon, one of the writers of the Old Testament, King David's son, this is, this is what he says. See if you can relate to this. Ecclesiastes 1.18. The, the greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. See, I, I relate to this. Maybe you do too. I, I think when I was younger, that wouldn't have made no sense to me whatsoever. But for those of us that are a little bit older, and for me, the older that I get, the more I come to understand, the more I know about life, the more brokenness that I see, the more brokenness that I experience, so that's experiential knowledge, you know what I find is that the more my sorrow actually increases. I mean, haven't you ever thought or said, I kind of wish I didn't know that? This is why I've seen some people get old and bitter while other people get old and sweet. The latter live blessed lives because I believe they have experienced God as their comforter in a grief-filled world. The difference is God promises comfort. We can be happy even in this broken world because we, because we, we have a God who sees, we have a God who cares. I mean, He really does care about our emotions. He cares about what we feel. He heals our wounded hearts. God blesses those who mourn because God is going to show up in that pain. He promises to. God shows up in our mourning just in profound ways. Today what I want to do is I want to talk about four ways we, we all experience mourning and grief. Just, just common human experiences of mourning and how God shows up and brings comfort in all of those ways. Four ways we're actually blessed when we mourn. So here you go. You ready? Number one. First, we mourn over our own brokenness. Uh, I believe we can all relate to the feelings of guilt and shame and regret and disappointment with ourselves. We've all been disappointed with ourselves. And I think this Romans 7.24 passage just is, is a very common human experience. Look, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and, and death? We, 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 we talked about Romans 7 last week, but here we're just touching on it again. Because we, we all can relate to that. It's like, ugh, why can't I be better? Why can't I be beyond this? Why, why can't I change? Without God's comfort, guilt and shame can destroy our lives. We see our own faults and our flaws and our mistakes, our habits, our patterns, and it makes us miserable. We mourn our own inability to change ourselves. We can often get trapped in our failures, our attitudes, these, these feelings and behaviors, and we just start wondering things. We start drawing some conclusions. We start thinking how God must feel. I mean, if I'm this disappointed in myself, God certainly must be disappointed with me. I mean, I mean how could he not be? Maybe we even start doubting how much God loves us. Okay, I know he loves me a little bit, but, but, but certainly he loves other people who are, who are much more consistent than I am. And we can get trapped in that guilt, shame, that darkness. Years ago, I was counseling a young lady. This was years before Foothills, and I was having a, this, this young woman come into my office where the church where I was at at the time, and and yes, she had quite a past, and she was so struggling with guilt and shame. She was just buried in it. She felt like her past was unforgivable because of, of, of the, the things that she had done, and I was trying to get her to understand God's forgiveness and God's grace and God's mercy and how much God loves her. And she just, she just could not grasp the concept. And she wasn't even a, a believer yet, but, and, and, but still, she was still coming in to meet. And her guilt and shame was so 
entrenched in her that one time she got up after we were done, she was going to leave the office, and she walked to my door, and then before she left, before she opened the door, she turned around and she says, you know what? She says, I bet after I leave this office, I bet you're so disgusted, you get up with a can of Lysol and you spray everything down and wipe it down after I leave. I, I, I just, I, I looked at her and it just, and it broke my heart. I said, no, no, I mean, no. But it was, it was incredible how locked into that guilt and shame she was and how much damage it did to her. God wants to meet us in our own brokenness. He wants to remove the sorrow of guilt and shame from our lives. So how does he do this? Okay, so let's go to the comfort part. God comforts us with his unconditional love and forgiveness. Romans 8, 34. Who then will condemn us? We do a good job condemning ourselves, right? We're professionals at that. But who will condemn us? No one for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. He is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. You know, if you're taking notes, look at how many times it says, for us, for us, for us. Three times. Died for us. Was raised to life for us. Pleading for us, for you. Romans 8, 38, and I'm convinced that nothing, nothing, what does nothing mean? It means nothing. Can ever separate us from God's love. That even means your failure and your flaws and your worst day you've ever had. When we find ourselves mourning yet another personal failure, it is the comfort of God's unconditional love, his unconditional forgiveness that breathes life in us, hope in us, that come on, get back up again. I love you. I believe in you. We can try again together. I, I think of I think this example of, of Peter in the Bible. Some of you know the story, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. Peter had epic failure. Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. Well, what did Peter do? In Jesus' darkest moment, in his greatest time of need, being arrested, being beaten, well, getting <laughs> hours before his crucifixion, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times. I mean, not just once. Peter chose to protect his own life, his own skin, instead of standing up for Jesus. And yet, and yet Jesus restored him, forgave him, transformed him, transformed him. I'm figuring, man, if, if Jesus can comfort Peter and raise him back up again, he can do that for you too, no matter what you've done. Here's, another, here's the second thing. We, we also mourn over our own, or, or we mourn over the brokenness of others. So we mourn over our brokenness, that's the first thing. And then we mourn over the brokenness of others. Who hasn't been betrayed? Who hasn't been lied to? Who hasn't been disappointed by others? <clears throat> we see people undermine each other in the workplace. We see family members not getting along. We see Sometimes even we are the target of mean-spirited remarks or mean-spirited social media po posts. We've never seen that, right? The Apostle Paul talks about the, how the actions of others have impacted him emotionally when he writes this, Philippians 3, 18. Now, Paul's actually in jail. He's in prison when he's writing this. So picture Paul writing this letter to the church in, in Philippi, a city, he says, for I have told you often before, and I say it again with now with tears in my eyes. So now he's actually thinking of people. And as he thinks of these people, the pain wells up inside of him. Maybe as he's writing, tears are dripping on the parchment, huh? He says that they're Many whose conduct shows that the real enemies of the cross of Christ broke his heart. Folks, people act in a way so contrary to God and his kingdom, it hurts. It brings sorrow. It's not always aimed at us. We're, we're simply exposed to others' anger and bitterness and slander and rage and arrogance and just general lack of love going on. 
The brokenness of others sometimes just takes a heavy toll on our hearts. And we mourn. Many of you have made comments to me over the past couple of weeks about watching some of the protests that started. You watched it on your screens, the blatant destruction of property, the violence, the anger, the rage. You said, Pastor, I, I watched it and I just cried. I can relate. Me too. We watched and we mourned together over brokenness. We mourned the reason behind it. We mourn racism and injustice and the oppression of every kind. So what does God do? Where's God in all this? God comforts us by empowering us to love and forgive others. The answer to hatred is not more hatred. The answer to violence is never more violence. This only makes the mourning worse. It makes the grief multiply. Instead, Jesus says this, Matthew 5, 44, But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. A few verses later, he says, If you love only those who love you, big deal. That was my translation, okay? What reward is there for that, Jesus said. Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you any different from anyone else? Ah, even, even pagans, even unbelievers do that. So what? Peter asked Jesus a question about forgiveness in Matthew 18. Peter came to him, came to Jesus and said, uh, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? And if, if we're realistic, when Peter said seven times, we would have to say, well, that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. Yeah, seven times. Wow, that's a lot. Jesus says, not even seven times. Jesus replied, 70 times seven. Huh? Excuse me? What do you mean by that? It's a lifestyle. It's continual. It's constant. There really is no number of times. It's, it's part of the environment of your relationships. It, it's how we live. Love and forgiveness is the answer for the soul that mourns the brokenness we see in others. Jesus wants to meet us in our relational pain, our relational grief. You say, how? I, I don't understand. Here's all I know. You have to invite him into it. Well, what do you mean? I pray like this sometimes. Lord, I, I want to love. I don't know how. I want to do the loving thing. Show me what that is. Lord, I want to forgive. I don't want to be angry over this. I don't want to be vengeful. I don't want to resent. I don't want to be bitter. Lord, help me forgive. Because I don't think I can do it in my own strength. And Jesus will say, you're right, you can't, but I can put it in you. The way we're comforted when we mourn relational brokenness is by allowing Jesus to empower us to keep loving, keep forgiving, keep being compassionate. We must continue to expose our mourning hearts to Jesus every day. Otherwise, our hearts have a tendency to get hard and they get calloused by all the sorrow we see day after day after day. And that's not being blessed. A hard heart cannot be blessed. A hard heart cannot be blessed, cannot be happy. God comforts us by empowering us with the ability to love and forgive. Here's the third thing. We also mourn over the brokenness of loss. Brokenness of loss. The older we get, the more loss we experience. That's a fact. Grief is not just the loss of loved ones, although that's certainly part it's just loss in general. You just consider how much loss we have all experienced through this pandemic. All of us. There's been a loss of jobs, loss of vacations, loss of planned events like graduations, kids' activities, anniversaries, weddings. There's been just a loss of normalcy. Who feels normal anymore? Loss of routines, loss of structure. There's been the loss of the familiar 
loss of gatherings with family and friends, loss of security for some people, loss of health, loss of finances, loss of future. And of course, there is the loss of life, the loss of loved ones. As I was trying my own, trying to understand my own emotions through this pandemic, came to understand just how much loss impacts me. It's like, Lord, how come I'm feeling this inside? It's loss. It's grief. It's mourning. It's sorrow. Let me be transparent. One of the biggest things for me that I struggle with is the loss of not seeing all of you. Loss just takes a toll, no matter what it is. So how does God comfort? God comforts us in our loss by being close. We encounter God in very profound and personal ways when we mourn. God cares deeply about how we feel. Our broken hearts matter to Him. Therefore, in our mourning, He draws close in just very profound ways Psalm 34 is such a beautiful promise. Now look, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Isn't it beautiful? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. God doesn't pull away when we hurt. He draws even closer. He comes to the rescue. My spiritual journey has shown me that the greatest, the most intimate spiritual connections I have ever had with Jesus have all come when I have been brokenhearted and my spirit has been crushed. They typically do not come on the mountaintop experiences. I've had great times with God on mountaintops, don't get me wrong. But the most intimate times have always come in the valleys, in the darkness, in the pain. And when Jesus meets you, when you are at your worst, when you face your darkest moment, your darkest challenge, then that statement, that promise makes sense. Blessed are those who mourn. Then you get it. Then it finally makes sense to you. When Jesus draws close to you, when you're bro brokenhearted and crushed, you feel blessed beyond words. If you find yourself brokenhearted and crushed today, please know that Jesus cares deeply for you. Please don't push him away. He wants to be close. Let him draw near to you. The last thing we mourn is this. We mourn over the brokenness of this world. It's, it's a little bit like number two, what talked about people, but on a bigger scale. We're exposed to so much global information, it's just unlike any time in history. We watch brokenness play out on our screens every day. We watch poverty and injustice, and we see worn, torn cities, and famine, and disease, and natural disasters, and cities that are on fire. And I mean, on and on and it goes, and it just makes our, our hearts ache. Seeing so much brokenness globally, it can cause us to just lose hope. We lose hope it will ever change. We lose hope it will ever get better. What's the point? It's broken beyond repair. And, and, and then we, we lose hope and then our hearts despair. How does God comfort us when we see so much despair and we feel it in our own lives? God comforts us by reminding us it will not always be this way. Romans 8 says, For we know that all creation, I mean the creation ex itself, the whole world, the trees, the air, the rocks, the water, the fish, okay, they all groan, they groan, they mourn as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. It's not the way it's supposed to be. So broken. And we believers also groan. We mourn. 
even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of the future glory, what's to come? We long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. No kidding. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights. He's going to make it right again as adopted children, including the new bodies he's promised us. God's going to make everything right someday. Humanity and all creation will someday be released from the sin and the brokenness that, that, that we all experience. Having something to look forward to, it gives us hope. It gives us endurance. I mean, haven't you ever experienced this in a much smaller way? I mean, you just have something on the calendar to look forward to. Hey, it's Monday. It's going to be a tough week. But hey, Friday's date night. Friday, we're going to do something together. So you just kind of have a little more endurance during the week. Sometimes that's why it's important to have time off or vacations. It's like, hey, we've got a tough quarter coming up, but we've got a vacation out here. We have, we have a week off. And, and so you just, you know something good is coming, and it just gives you endurance to just hang in there. There is a future comfort God gives us as we groan over the brokenness of this world. It's just not always going to be like this. It's not always going to be this hard. Don't despair. Don't lose hope. A week ago, I was, I was home, and I was just sitting on the couch and had me on my feet up, and I was just kind of laying there, and I was reading the Bible on my phone, and Lisa walks by, and she sees me sitting there, and she looked at my phone, and she saw what I was reading. I was reading in the book of Revelation, okay? Now, before I tell you what she said, some of you say, what's the big deal? Now, Revelation talks about the end times, talks about God's judgment on the world, and it does describe some really horrible things, okay, in there. So she saw that I was reading the book of Revelation, and she looked at me with a grin on her face, and she says, what are you doing? Just seeing how bad it's going to get? Okay, we both laughed. I said, no. I said, sometimes I just need to read the end of the story to remind myself that everything's going to be made right someday. And what I was reading was Revelation 21, and let me conclude by sharing it with you. This is what I was reading. Because I was having a hard day. Sometimes your emotions just kind of get dark. Revelation 21 says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. God comforts us by reminding us of our future. He reminds us it's not always going to be broken, and we won't always groan for what's coming. I realize that mourning and blessing seem like very odd, a very odd combination. But this beatitude gives us hope, so much hope in this imperfect world. We are not left alone to mourn. We are blessed because we have a God who sees who cares, and who comforts us. And may you experience his comfort in all of his abundance this week, even, even if you mourn. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, we recognize that we live in a, a broken world, and we ourselves are broken. And all the brokenness that we are exposed to in ourselves and in others. And Lord, it, it's, it takes a toll on us. It takes a toll on our hearts. There's no way for us to experience life without loss, without grief, and without mourning. And so I wanna, I wanna, I'm so thankful for this promise that you, you bless those who mourn because you're going to show up. You, you're, you're, the, you're the comforter. You bring comfort in ways that we can't even have words to understand, but yet you show up in our pain. You don't leave us alone. You don't abandon us. So whatever 
grief or mourning or pain, anybody who's going through right now watching this, I know you can show up in it. You're close to the brokenhearted. You rescue those who, who are crushed in spirit. That's who you are. And when we experience you in our mourning, yes, we are blessed. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you come after us when we hurt. Thank you that you don't abandon us to our pain. Thank you that we are your dearly loved children. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll bless you.
everybody, welcome back. Thank you for joining us today. It's awesome to think that we can worship together this way and we can hear from the heart of God together this way. Thank you, thank you for being here. Couple quick things to remind you of. Parents out there, there's tons of great things for your children from our Kids Church program available on our website. And also if you have teenagers, have them join us on uh, Instagram Live at 11 a.m. Uh, Sunday morning on our search and rescue Instagram page. Super fun reading through the book of John. Oh, that is cool. Hey, we also want to uh, remind you of our worship and prayer time that happens online each week. It yes. now is happening on Tuesday mornings at 8 a.m. on our live stream. You can just go to the live stream, live stream and join a whole community of people just sharing scripture together, praying and worshiping together. Uh, Pastor John is leading that. It's a really cool time. We want to remind you of that. I love it. Now for our big announcement. Mm. Foothills Church has made the decision to open up June 21st for two services, both 8 a.m and 10 a.m. That's right. As we mentioned earlier, we're standing on a lift looking at an empty auditorium right now. It is gonna be filled next Sunday and we wanna invite you to join us. We will have chairs set up appropriately distanced. We wanna keep everyone safe and comfortable. We also have cleaning supplies throughout the building uh, which we will be utilizing and thoroughly cleaning between services. Yes, and don't forget, now Brian and I are gonna talk about the how, but Pastor Dale put a video out talking about why we're opening and that's very important to see. Yes. Uh, so those two services will be 8 and 10 a.m. Two choices there. Uh, but also, if you're not comfortable coming in, that's totally okay too. There will be, both those services will be live streamed. And then after 8 o'clock, you can access the recorded service on Sunday mornings and see it that way as well. Yes, it'll be uploaded to YouTube and all the, the regular places, but nope. won't be available until that point, unlike what we're currently doing. Yes. Now, Sam, is there going to be uh, kids ministries? There's no kids ministries, there's no student ministries. We're working on right now just putting together uh, the services for everyone just to come in as a family, come and join us. There will be kids kits available mm -hmm. for your children, and it's gonna be fun to see everybody. Now, this, is a mask. What is a good? Yeah, it's not a string bikini. I'm so glad you had me worry this. Yeah, yeah. red is not my color. So <laughs> if you have a mask and feel comfortable wearing a mask, please do. If you would, uh, if you prefer not to wear a mask, that's okay too. Again, check out Pastor Dale's video yeah. about how to do this and how we're going to love each other yes. in the middle of uh, this whole thing. Okay, so if you have a mask, wear it. I'll be wearing this one so nobody feels uncomfortable wearing theirs. Okay, perfect. Hey, whether you're with us next Sunday or you're still at home watching it, we hope you have a great week. We miss you, we love you, and we do look forward to seeing you really soon.